You're listening to The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa. Rafa exists to improve your ride with the finest kit, inspiring stories and vibrant clubhouses across the globe. My name's Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello again, Richard. Where are we, Lionel? We're in London, in Angel, in sort of north-ish London. Where's Daniel? I don't know. Oh, no, he's at the Dauphiné. He's at the Criterium du Dauphiné, somewhere in the French Alps. Moonlighting for a television company there, I believe. Um, so he'll we'll be back next week with our first post-Giro regular podcast, but... We're giving you something a little bit different this week, and we thought we'd, but we thought we'd introduce it properly because, and also chat a little bit about the Hammer Series because that was an event that we've been talking about all year. Lionel promised to go, uh, didn't fulfil that promise. I'm sure he has very good reasons for that. You know, he he ate a lot in Italy, and I think you've just been lying in a darkened room digesting all that, haven't you? Well, I've actually been riding my bike to try. I and thought lose, so. I thought so. To try and lose my Giro weight before I put it all back on again at the tour. <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, so this week we're going to hear uh, another lunch with Lionel. You did a lunch with Charlie Wigelius at the end of last year. A very good listen it was. You had lunch uh, just before the Giro, I think, with Paul Watson, a rider who, a former rider who people will not be familiar with. We'll hear about that and then introduction, proper introduction to Paul Watson a little bit later. We thought we'd just open this episode just very briefly talking about the Hammer Series because Daniel will certainly have things to say about that as well. Um, you know, not least uh, thanks to his great friendship for us over cocktails in the Middle East with Graham Bartlett of Velon. But Daniel will definitely have things to say about the Hammer series. And so we'll, we'll return to it next week. We're going to hear from Tail Gig and Hart, the team Skyrider, who played a very prominent role in the three races and arguably won it for Team Sky in the end. So we'll hear a bit from him. Uh, but Lionel, what, what were your thoughts? What did you make of it? Well, I enjoyed it. I'm not terribly sure I understood it because we have no context against which to kind of compare it I didn't you know there was no kind of tactical backdrop there was where particularly on the hilly stage I wasn't sure whether riders were making punctuation police don't know what you said wrong there but they're on the case well yeah I on the hilly stage which was the most entertaining of the three I felt I didn't really know is are these riders making a good decision here or a bad decision and I suspect the riders themselves didn't know and and so there was a kind of a a naivety and an honesty to the racing it was a bit like making professional riders go and ride a fourth cat road race was there much tactical finesse was there much thinking about it or were they just hammering each other literally hammering each other into the ground I think it was probably the latter and as a spectacle it was entertaining whether or not it can work in exactly that format I don't know I would suspect although I don't know I would suspect that they will review it and look at ways to tweak the rules tweak the scoring system particularly because that was very complicated I I paid a lot of attention and I wasn't able to really follow who was leading why there were decimal points for the points I mean that seemed illogical to me although I assume it was so that there weren't ties and then I didn't really know how the points accrued converted into the time gaps for the final time trial or the chase as they called it it kind of slotted into place eventually but it wasn't particularly intuitive nevertheless it was entertaining and certainly an experiment that you'd like to see repeated and obviously it will be yeah it was very innovative um it wasn't as good as the giro uh, you know so uh, that's another context we're looking at this in the context of 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 the the established model of road racing which we love but I, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it probably more than I thought I was going to enjoy it. I think what's interesting about it, um, and we saw this in, in the style of racing, was the right, they're all sort of domestiques. And um, there's not that usual model of there being a, a team leader who other riders are working for. They're all domestiques. They're all, um, they're all fighting, battling for a, a, a higher cause, a bigger cause. And Teo Gig and Hart will, will speak a little bit um, about that. I want to say as well, I, I really enjoyed the coverage of it by GCN, um, who... Uh, we're sort of cutting away to the studio and analysing it. There was a lot to get to grips with, and that that format of showing the racing and also sort of trying to puzzle it out, trying to figure it out as 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 it was going, worked well in in with this new format that, that, that everybody was struggling to get their heads around. Yeah, I think the 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 one day that kind of let it down was the sprint day because it was billed as kind of watching the sprinters go head to head, and there were some very good sprinters in the field. Uh, Caleb Ewan crashed 
Fernando Gaviria had a problem and pulled out. Giacomo Nizzolo didn't really figure, and it wasn't really a it wasn't really a battle of the sprinters as build. But nevertheless, it was engaging. I just you know, I'm not terribly sure that course worked, although it looked incredibly hard. It, and and I think the point you make about Theo Gagan Hart, he would never get an opportunity to race like that that aggressively, put himself into the red, put himself into uh, you know positions where he has to think about his tactics and what he's trying to do. And I think I've focused on that because obviously we know Tao and we know Team Sky, but there were riders from other teams in a similar position. And so they were given a great opportunity to go out and, and, and race on kind of instinct and feel and, and just aggression rather than on you know numbers and carefully plotting out exactly what you know they've got to do over the course of the race so in, in that sense it was entertainment um whether it was a sort of pure sporting contest i'm not terribly sure because i think the point system was just a bit gimmicky um and i think you know this one was very um unpredictable because we had no nothing to judge it against what will be really interesting is the next time with the knowledge that the riders and the sports directors have of the first one and how it worked out how will they race it the second time i'm looking forward to that well, let's hear from one of those riders, Tail Gagan Hart, who played a very active, prominent role in the three days. Here he is, Tail Gagan Hart. Tail, well, I mean, you had, you had a pretty prominent role at the Hammer Series. As a rider going into it, uh, did you really know what to expect, or were you sort of in the dark as much as everybody else? Definitely didn't know what to expect. I mean, we had some pretty uh, long and interesting conversations about it in the days and actually lead up to it as it kind of starts to look into the into the race more um i was definitely the subject to a bit of ridicule after the first day the climbing day because i'd said beforehand that i thought that the sprinters were going to take up the first at least 50 percent of the points for the race and obviously as we saw that definitely didn't uh, materialize so yeah we didn't we didn't know what to expect i guess the one thing we knew was it was going to be uh, aggressive racing and uh, and different to, to what we've done before and I think it definitely lived up to both of those the the race did quite what I thought was a really really good idea they had a big screen on the the back side of the course which had all the points on it um, so that was also really good from a rider's perspective in terms of seeing where you stood and, and often seeing how close it was between the top five or six teams so yeah I think there was quite a lot of tactics involved in terms of looking around and seeing which teams had numbers and, and kind of trying to think of what to do and, and at the same time it was kind of just really getting stuck into the racing and, and uh, not really holding back. Did you enjoy it? I did. Yeah, I definitely did. I think the first day was was great. Uh, it was definitely an honour to be racing alongside someone like Tom de Milan as well. So recently after the Giro, that was pretty cool. I was watching that like everyone else last week so especially you know what what are his home modes that was uh yeah that was cool and yeah i did enjoy it the second day was flat out that was probably a bit less enjoyable than the first day but uh it was a lot harder to predict the second day and there was loads of teams within a really small amount of points of each other and it was really aggressive racing so it was actually a really really intense day of racing and then the third day yeah, you kind of spend it all morning knowing that you're going to be doing 45Ks flat out and that there's no way it's going to be anything other than really, really hard. So all of that said, yeah, it was it was really enjoyable. What did you feel when uh, Sunweb caught you in the team time trial? Because it's a very odd team time trial with first across the line wins. You must have felt the sort of pressure coming from behind. I was talking to someone about it today, about the kind of like what it's like chasing someone as opposed to being in front I mean, mm. it's very very different I think um, and he'd been in one of the teams which was kind of a little bit further back so they were chasing and being chased and and he said how different it was kind of just having that team in front of you as a, as a carrot um, and obviously there's some small aerodynamic advantages and, and other stuff as well um, but yeah I mean when when they caught us it was kind of a weird moment of you hadn't we hadn't lost the race but there they were after we'd been trying to hold them off for that kind of 25 30 k's prior so it was kind of a strange uh, juxtaposition of right 
trying to kind of communicate tactics in that situation was was even pretty pretty difficult um just had to be kind of clear and concise and and we kind of pretty immediately on the road spontaneously decided what we were going to do we stuck to it and it ended up being the, the perfect tactic so that was I think that probably made the kind of crossing the line more enjoyable even than, than maybe winning the race the cycling podcast is supported by science in sport science in sport fueled by science Thank you very much indeed to Science Sport for sponsoring the cycling podcast as they're doing throughout 2017. Uh, you can get 20% off all your Science Sport products at sciencesport.com if you enter the code CPOD20 at the checkout. CPOD20 for 20% off. Thank you very much indeed to them. They helped us around the Giro and uh, we're just sort of uh, we're decompressing from the Giro. So we're doing something a little bit unusual this week we're having giving ourselves a light week aren't we Lionel we're giving you a lunch with Lionel and um, we're going to hear it now Lionel's going to introduce it uh, we'll come back at, at the end and, and wrap things up maybe just um, maybe just debrief very 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 briefly on on the Giro play also a, a clip from uh, our latest friend special which was released this week which was an audio diary kept at the Women's Tour of California by Alexis Ryan the kind of SRAM rider um, but Lionel can you introduce your lunch with please I can indeed. Um, it was a conversation, a meeting I had with Paul Watson, who may not be a name that's terribly familiar to all of our listeners, but if you were following cycling 30 years ago, you may well be aware that Paul Watson rode for the ANC Halfords team that rode the Tour de France in 1987. Uh, that ANC Halfords team was the first British team to ride the Tour since 1968. Then it was another, you know, 20 odd years before Team Sky Road in 2010 and so ANC Halford sort of stands as this kind of curio really a, a team that we all when I was interested in cycling getting interested in cycling in the mid 80s wondering why there wasn't I'm not sure yeah we must be near a hospital or something I think it's not It's not actually Rob Hatch in the pronunciation but Rob Hatch in full uniform but yeah, carry on, Lionel. Even I can pronounce Paul Watson correctly. Um, but Paul Watson was. It's, you know, we've just heard from Theo Gagan Hart, and it, it just struck me. I wonder how Paul Watson would have coped, or would have thrived, perhaps, if there'd been a, a bigger, better, more organised team around than ANC Halfords. Uh, in 2007, to mark the 20th anniversary of ANC Halfords having ridden the Tour de France, I went and interviewed um, a few of their riders, Adrian Timmis, Malcolm Elliott, uh, Phil Griffiths, who was the team manager, Shane Sutton and Paul Watson. And they all had very interesting stories to tell them. And Paul Watson's career really was all around that spring and summer 1987 because he finished six in Flesh Wallone that year as a completely out of the blue result for this nothing team really that was trying to get a place in the Tour de France and they got given a place in the Tour de France or rather they paid £30,000 for a place in the Tour de France as they as they had to at the time that was the entry fee largely to mark the 20th anniversary of Tom Simpson's death the 87 Tour went to Mont Ventoux and so there was all this kind of you know symbolism that, that meant it was appropriate for a British team to ride and as Paul Watson will explain Really, they arrived at the Tour absolutely burnt out because they'd spent the whole of the first half of 1987 racing everywhere across Europe in order to earn the right to basically get a place in the Tour de France. And so by the time they got to West Berlin, which was where the Grand Depart was that year, they were on their knees, probably none more so than Paul Watson. He only made it half a dozen days into the race. And then his career, he went to Belgium and he, he was had a short-lived period riding for the Hitachi team there and then he basically was more or less ousted from professional road racing and you'll hear why in the conversation now the reason I wanted to speak to Paul was because late last year he actually won a world championship for I think riders age 55 50 to 55 so he, I hadn't spoken to him for a, a couple of years or so and I saw a picture on Twitter of him wearing a rainbow jersey and I thought blimey I thought Paul Watson had given up riding his bike he was really sort of a little bit down on cycling when I'd spoken to him in 2007 it wasn't a period of his life that he remembered with a great deal of fondness um, so I thought well he'd be a good subject for a lunch with unfortunately what I hadn't realized was that he'd had a really terrible accident not long after winning that um, veterans world championship 
a camper van that he'd bought had rolled into him, crushing him against a wall and had seriously damaged his leg. And in fact, he's had five operations since that happened last autumn, spent over 28 hours in surgery. He is on the men now. Um, and so when I caught up with him in Milton Keynes, he was explaining to me at the outset exactly what had happened to him. Hello, Paul. How are you doing? Good to see you. Yeah, good. You caught me right in the middle of it here. We're just going to finish off here. Well, I don't mind waiting a, a second or two. Shall I take a seat? Yeah, yeah, take a seat. And we're, are we going over the road, are we? Yeah, wherever you want to go. Yeah, I've booked us a table, so uh, it's lunch with, isn't it? And you're buying, apparently. <laughs> yeah, quite happy to buy. You, and you're, you're, on, you're on crutches, Paul. We're going to have to talk about what's happened to you. Yes. Um, should we go wander across the road there? Well, well, what should we go? Uh, yeah, as long as, you can, as long as you're going to be Yeah, alive. yeah, I'm all right, yeah. Uh, I'm on crutches, as you can see. I've got a, sort of an external leg brace on here. Um... I, I, it was a quite a horrific accident. I, I, I smashed my um, tibia and fibula, um, and in, in a bad way as well. I, um, I, as you know, I, I, I was world masters champion, which sort of come as a bit of a surprise, and um, and so then all of a sudden I was getting some some sort of sponsorship sort of inquiries, and, all, and Men's Health rang me up and. So I thought, well, maybe get myself a motorhome and make it all look pro and get get it all looking good. And so I bought this like massive motorhome, and I uh, thought it'd be nice, you know, before the races, you have a bit of a social do. So I was having like coffee machine fitted and washing machine and everything like that. And um, I just drove it over to a friend's house. We only had it a few days, and still not quite sure. It's only it's been garaged since the event in September, and and it's just gone now to a proper garage to have it checked out. But as I was walking in front of it, it started moving and uh, it, it crushed me against the two foot wall and it pushed the wall back, trapped me there for about 10 minutes. Uh, I was like dragged off and um, or the, the, the motorhome was dragged off me, but then we had to wait another half an hour for the ambulance to arrive. Um, I was then sent, well, it was an hour and a half up to, to, to Addenbrooke's. Um, but it was so severe that they um, they put the limb salvage team on on, on the on the job. So um, I then then had uh, just a horrific sort of 24 days where initially it was you know they talked to me about it coming off, and then but then they, after sort of extensive scans they they started operating and. Um, I had four four operations. One was a twelve hour op, and they they said uh, I was about as close as I could be with it not coming off. You know, as close as I could be to losing it without it coming off, really. And uh, so it's pretty horrific. Well, you're you're at least mobile, and you've you've saved your leg. I had no idea. I, 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 the last I heard, Paul, you'd back on the bike, um, winning races. Well, that, that was a good bit. I mean, that was a good... That's where the... Basically, November November 2015, I decided I was going to get back in the gym. And uh, so I got myself a personal trainer and started going, well, almost every three or four, well, four times a week, really. I was getting really into it. And I got on the cross trainer and um, I started seeing the sort of watts, power, average watts going up and up and up. And that was all kind of new to me. I didn't really... It was all the... You know, everyone is into it now, and I am as well. But at the time, I didn't really know what it was all about. So I kept asking, you know, what's this mean? What, what, what should, what's a good figure? What's a good number? And then, uh, so I hit 330 watts. I thought, I thought that's not bad, that. And so, so I went over to Belgium in number first, got on the bike, second of April. Went out with Sean Dines, who battered me. Uh, nice coffee stop. And then April just went out on my bike. May I went to Belgium, and was riding with. Uh, Tim Harris, David Tim Harris and uh, um, Rodrigo Contreras who was the uh, pro for Quick Step was staying with Tim at the time so we, we were out there that was April, that would be May um, I bumped into um, Chris Van Meeren who was the team doctor for the Belgian national team and he said look you, you really should have a, a check up you know you really should be you know the ex-pros and everything really should be checked for the heart and everything before you go 
you know, sort of thrashing yourself again. So I went to his lab and he's got a full extensive, you know, blood tests, all the, you know, all the machinery. I got on a bike, stationary bike. And uh, I thought I was going to have some good... Actually, bearing in mind, I'd only been on the bike two months. And he said, you're about as, foot as a, fit as a footballer, he said. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, so he said uh, you've got no, you're just running on sugars. He said, you've got no, no base at all. So I was right. So I took myself off to Spain and went to Denia in June and did five hours a day with, with uh, Kevin, Kevin Ibbotson, who was out there on holiday. So it was really good. We, me and him just went out in, in the mountains, just riding that bike five hours a day. That was June. July, went back to Belgium, turned up with all the Rainer boys, parked myself up at Café Surplace where they were staying. And I had a really lovely, really lovely July. I was, I was riding the elite races. I didn't, didn't ride the Masters. I, I thought I'd throw myself right in with the elites. So I finished them all, which was a, a lot that didn't think I would. Bear in mind, this is only three months in. And then, uh, that was July. And in August, my first Masters race was the World. <laughs> and having come from the elites, you know, it was quite a, it was quite a walk, you know. And so I... Um, so I just basically I rode away and just and I won it on my own. So it was quite quite good. <laughs> and then I was kicking I was kicking out 370 watts at that point, and I thought, geez, I've only just started, so I was getting really excited. And then I threw myself in front of a bus and nearly killed myself. <laughs> but you've got a rainbow jersey. I've got a rainbow jersey. Yes, yes. But I haven't been able to wear it yet, so I've, I've just I framed it because I thought, well, so um, yeah, that's where I'm at at the moment. Well, we've, we've nearly made it to a restaurant. Let's go and have some lunch. Yes, yes. It's, uh, I'll come in most lunch times. And um, I've booked a table and they said it shouldn't be too noisy, so hopefully that'll be all right. Perfect. Paul, the last time I saw you, 2011, you basically, you weren't cycling. You, you said you, there's nothing in your house that would give any indication that you'd been a cyclist. You said you'd much rather go for a run. What happened? Yeah, I don't know really. I, 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 uh, as I say, I got in the gym. I got all in, inspired by all these um, stats, which I think a lot of people do now, don't they? And I can see why. You know, the Garmin and all these sections and segments and King at KOMs and that's now. But at the beginning, I, it was all down to the cross trainer. I just kept seeing this average watts and I kept asking people, what, 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 what do you do then? What, what does it mean? You know. And then I, and I kept seeing it climb. 10 watts every couple of weeks you know it was going up and up and up and um, and I think that's what did it and then going and getting a nice new bike and suddenly it was all kind of exciting again and I could see what the appeal was you know because when you were young your dad kind of got you into cycling didn't he Um, and you said to me when we've spoken before that you enjoyed it but you didn't love it yeah I think it was um, back then it wasn't as nice as it looks now Meaning the the uh, all the all the support and the back all the yeah basically all the support that's there now um, we just didn't have that you know I mean I I was um, was talking to Tim Harris the other day and we were, we had to go on the doll and then and then I remember racing for England and then going to collect my doll money and she saying why hadn't I signed on the week before well the thing was I was racing for England. In a national in a national jersey, but you couldn't tell that to them, otherwise your doll money would stop. Which seems probably, you know, nowadays you're getting lottery funding, and and it was hard, you know, it was harder then. Um, so I, I don't think I really did enjoy it at the time. How did it all start for you then? Uh, well, I rode slightly across, and I was good at that. I was schoolboy champion, and then I was junior champion, and then I went onto the road and. And then I went to Belgium, sorry, went to France, and then I rode for Laradou, and then I um, came back, rode the milk race, got 14th in the first one, and then, and by that point, that's all you know what, that's all you can do, and then you think, well, hold on a minute, I can become pro, and then maybe I can make a living out of it. So you can't really stop at that point, you know. What was it like as a kid being into cycling? Because I think you grew up in Hemel Hempstead, didn't you? Which is where I went to school as well. So you, you probably had a fairly similar upbringing to me. Cycling wasn't something that kids really did. It wasn't. It wasn't. Certainly wasn't cool, was it? No, no. Wearing tights back then was quite cool, was it? And um, but then because we had a good, good uh, John Dowling was there and. Um, 
Jamie Hunt Jeremy Hunt was there and uh, we had um, you know it was I remember it, it, it was good good scene um, good club room I remember that and then we moved up to Milton Keynes but yeah back then it wasn't it wasn't it was you, you were fringe weren't you very fringe what was school like for you were you were you good at school no not really I was like, <laughs> typical sort of uh, staring out the window causing trouble you know couldn't concentrate didn't do my homework yeah, normal stuff. So cycling, it quite quickly, it's it's a sport of patience, really, isn't it? You talked just before about going for five-hour rides. When you were nineteen, twenty, was that something that you enjoyed doing? Or I mean, the, the amount of time you've got to dedicate to it, it's a lot, isn't it? If you've got an active mind, it must be quite difficult. Yeah, but I, I did enjoy the training. I did enjoy the. Um, no, I didn't enjoy. It. I, yeah. Mm. I don't really know, really. It was something that I... I guess if you're winning, and I was winning, then you carried on, didn't you? Probably if I hadn't won, I probably would have, would have stopped probably quite early. But I did find... I did win quite a lot, quite early. But back then, it wasn't a sport... That you, you talked about maybe turning pro, because British people had turned pro. Um, but it wasn't a sport where you could imagine earning a fortune, I guess. No, but I mean, said that, I went to road for Laradoot. Uh, <clears throat> and so I, and I was the only cross rider, sorry, road for Laradoot for cross, and I was their only cross rider. And so um, they gave me a team car. I lived in a nice house. I got, I was, got start money, prize money. Um, I, I saw an, an old, um, well, I <laughs> wrote me accounts down from back then, and I wasn't doing too bad, really. And I always knew I had, always had money in my pocket, so... Um, yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, I could, I could do it. You know. Larry Duke was the pro team of Paul Sherwin and Alain Bondu and another uh, other sort of top French riders at the time. Um, but your career started off with um, on the British scene, which was just kind of taking off, wasn't it? Mid eighties, the city centre criteriums were happening. It was getting on the TV. The milk race was a big deal. Um, it must have been quite exciting to be part of a scene that was growing and taking off. That was, I mean, I feel really lucky to have, have been through that period and caught that wave that was, that was happening back then. Because we were getting 60, 70,000 people turning up on those televised crit races. And all of a sudden, you know, you could be on TV and have one sponsor. You'd be, you didn't have to be in a team to get on TV. So suddenly the British pro scene started growing really rapidly. And that was a real good time. I feel lucky to have caught that, been part of that. So people say like Phil Corley is a friend of mine and he's he's 10 years older they've never really you know they kind of missed that and Sid Barris really just caught the end of it br- briefly but then you know so yeah we were lucky to have had that during our window of when we were racing so we're meeting up here it's it's spring 2017 um, the first time I met you was 2007 20 years after ANC Halford's ridden the Tour de France now 30 years um, time flies, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I've you shot myself. <laughs> well, I haven't crushed my leg against a wall, so oh. I, I, in comparison, I'm 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 very fortunate. Yeah, you're a lot better than me. Time is flying, isn't it? But I, what I was hoping to do, I was uh, I was hoping I was going to rewrite rewrite it a bit for the older guy, because I was doing, as I said on the way here, I was doing 370 watts after four months. I thought, wow, if I could start nudging 400, I might be in for a shout here, and I could probably. Probably just as well. I jumped in front of a bus. I think we're all put, turning the clock back, aren't we? We're all. It's all. It's not as, you know, 54, 55 was considered really old back. You know, in, in the recent. But I don't feel old at all. I mean, I feel young, really. Yeah, I think things are changing. It's interesting you talk about the enthusiasm you've got because of the numbers. When you were trying to make a way as a professional rider, you had none of that. The training techniques must have been almost prehistoric by comparison. Yeah, I mean, we were really kind of, it was all miles, 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 wasn't it? And then um, that's all we really did there, back then. And, and uh, now, I mean, I've, enjoyed, I've really enjoyed digging into those numbers. You know, left, right, power, your short power, all those curves that you can look at and, um, you know, which bit you can should concentrate on. And I, I, I was really getting into it. I, I really do feel frustrated because, um, you know, there I am now with my legging bits, but... Um, you never know if it, if it, if it mainly is just to join back up. I might hopefully I can get back out there again and start playing with those numbers. How do you think you'd have 
fared if you'd had all of this kind of technology and those numbers available to you in, in you know, the 1980s? Well, I think it would have probably appealed to different riders in different... I think probably if we, if we were all born in different eras, we might have done differently. The biggest input for me would have been having a support because I was really um, scatty, really. I couldn't hold my concentration. I'd, I'd, be, I'd fly off the handle at the slightest thing. I was, I was, a, I was like a skitty racehorse, really. And so I think the setup now would have been really suited me. Um, so I think that would have been more. And then now they've got these psychiatrists there and personal trainers, and you know, you've got this whole kind of support network that's around the riders. And I think that would have, that would have really helped me an awful lot. But let's go back 30 years to 1987 then. You were part of a, the biggest British pro team set up that there'd been up to that point. And of course, when we first talked about this, Team Sky hadn't yet happened. So, you know, there was a, a, you know, a lot of interest around AMC Halfords. But just explain to me a bit about the setup because you were, the team was split in two, wasn't it? And you, you were in one half of it. Yeah, because of uh, the UK rules, um, the, the team couldn't be beyond a certain number, and but we needed a, we needed a larger number to ride abroad. So they split it into two teams. You had Lycra, Lycra, wasn't it? And then uh, and then ANC Halfords. I was in the Lycra team, and um, and so but but effectively it was one team because when we went abroad it was all ANC, um, and the setup was. I'm sure you've got amateur teams now probably with more backing than we had back then. I mean, what we were trying to do or what they tried to do on, on what they had was quite remarkable, really. So you were um, part of one half of the team. Um, tell me about some of the other riders that were that were in that setup at the time. Joey, Malcolm, Adrian, Tim Harris. I mean, we had like loads of, you know, really good quality riders. Chris Liddywhite, Shane Sutton. It was a good team, you know. But we were thrown in at the deep end. You know, we really went in with what the backing we had and the support we had. It was quite incredible, really. We did what we did. That's Joey McLaughlin, Malcolm Elliott, Adrian Timmis. You know, it's three of the stars of that generation, weren't they? Malcolm, of course, went on and, and had a successful pro career. We'll talk a bit about Adrian and, and Joey um, and Malcolm a, a little bit later. But 1987 started. In your mind, was there any thought that the Tour de France was on the agenda? for the team at that time well I wish it hadn't been I think we would we were, we were going too far too fast I think we, we needed to have just taken us taken a step back that was the main problem if we'd have not gone to the tour we probably the team would have gone on for another three or four years or whatever and then maybe gathered some extra sponsors and you never know where it would have gone but the fact was it was foot to the floor pe pedal to the metal and it was just uh, do or die they threw all the money in including our money you know, because we I'd, I'd was, didn't get paid beyond May, and just to ride the tour, which was a kind of, it could have worked probably, possibly, but we were all so burnt by then. I mean, I, I was literally, literally on my knees by the time we got to the tour, because we were getting thrown into everything. Me, Malcolm, we were we were being thrown at everything to, to try and uh, get. Because at the time, it was the first year I think that the teams got points, and at one point we were sixth ranked team in the world, which was mad, and you know. The, the team was the brainchild of a quite an eccentric man, Tony Kappa. Um, I don't know how much you know now about his background or how much you knew about him when you first came into contact with him. Tell, tell me what he was like as a man and what you knew about him at the time. I mean, this guy must have weighed 25 stone. Easy. He just be a big character, big man, had some money, uh, he, 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 but he was a market stall sort of like mentality, really. But he, he, his heart was in the right place, you know. He really wanted to get get British cycling on, and he was he loved it. But there was just no no planning. There was no budget in. There was no there was nothing beyond just get over just just get over this weekend's racing. And it, it was looking back. I mean, it was it felt like some sort of like the Sex Pistols or some sort of band that just exploded, really. <laughs> Because I think Tony Kappa, he'd been a policeman, he'd, he'd possibly been in the armed forces, although no, never... definitely not. He told me he was an SAS, but there was no way. I don't know any time the SAS recruited 25 stone guys. Let's have plugged some hole somewhere. There's no way. <laughs> well, he was certainly a policeman, and he, was a, he, was, he owned taxi companies in, in Stoke-on-Trent, and then he had this haulage company, didn't he, which he 
uh, there was some kind of merger and, and, and the money from ANC became available to, to sponsor a cycling team. Um, and he, he got to know Phil Griffith, hadn't he, who was in the Potteries, I'm not sure whether he was from there, and he'd been, he'd been a, a rider. And I think they went on a sort of fact-finding trip to the Tour de France the previous year and Kappa was, he was completely captivated by it. And his enthusiasm carried the team forward, but, but perhaps not with the, the resources that you guys needed. Tell me about the start of 87 when um, you, you were off down to the south of France for a training camp and to do some races. Yeah, so there we are. We all st- Bikes hadn't arrived. So I, I had my old motor became that was literally on its last legs. I said, look, I can't. can't cause it said, literally was a battered out training bike must have weighed um, you wouldn't have nowadays you wouldn't have been to the shops on it and uh, I said you know this is all I've got and they said well the bike's on the line you better bring that so I took the mud guards off it they were supposed to meet me at Newport Pagnell Services before mo- mobile phones you know this is all that so right Newport Pagnell Services I will be there Phil Corley took me to and I was there they either missed Newport Pagnell Services or couldn't be bothered but they, or couldn't find me or whatever but they just drove straight on down to the south park missed me so I'm in the call box trying to phone up, where are they, what's going on? They were saying, oh, you weren't there anyway. Long and the short of it was, luckily, Shane couldn't get into France because of his visa was expired or something, he'd been Australian. So Shane had to come back. So they give him one of the cars and he had to come back. So I met him and then we went across on the ferry and then we drove down the next day to the south of France. We never got into the till three in the morning. But to be greeted by um, Griffiths, who was just like going mental, where were you? You weren't here. Just threw me a bit of some kit, said that, get in that room. So I, I was fuming. The next day was the Toile de Passage, I think. I think it was the Grand Prix Marseillaise, the one day race that, oh, that just before it, yeah. Well, I got third in that one, did I? Yeah. Okay, right. And then, um, yeah, so anyway, basically, I was so angry. They're still shouting at me or moaning at me the next day. I pulled it, I'm on this bike that is literally falling to bits, and. Um, I just went off in the first break, got on the front and just drove it for about 10 miles. And we got about three or four minutes up. Anyway, we stayed away, which, thank God, because it shut everyone up then and I was all right for the rest of the trip. But that was kind of the, the ANC Halfords way, was it? It kind of, there wasn't quite enough backing, quite enough funding, but you're trying to compete with, you know, teams that were, the big teams at that time, who would they have been? They would have been... Peugeot, there would have been Panasonic, I guess, big European teams that were part of the furniture, and, and you guys turning up. I mean, what was the reception like from, from the established European riders? Well, I remember back, back then, south of France, um, we weren't received very well at all, and we were kind of seen as some sort of kind of curiosity, and it didn't help the fact that we were all on different bikes, because we were all on our training bikes, really. And I remember being on the start line with Jerry Kinetman beside me and he was sort of like looks at me and then looked down at my bike and started laughing and goes like you, you can't ride on that and I was and I was I laughed with him and it's just so happened that later in the day I ended up in a break with him and I was like because I, I I was I must have gone with some good form because I was like driving I could see I had the better of him and then he was going hey hey strong boy hey slow down hey boy <laughs> so so. Uh, we, we was getting a little bit of respect, but I guess it didn't really happen until Malcolm got up there in Amstel and I got up there in Flesh, really, and then we, then it all changed. I guess for the European race organisers, there was a little curiosity factor, a British team. It was, of course, then 20 years since Tom Simpson had died, so there was the, the, the feeling of the anniversary um, being marked. The Tour de France was going to have its stage on Mont Ventoux in 87, 20 years after Tom Simpson had, had died. The Colombians had come over, the American 7-Eleven team has, was establishing itself, and, and so the, it's kind of logical, I guess, that a British team would be of interest to the European race organisers, which, were, I guess, worked both ways because it meant you kept getting these invites to these top races that clearly you couldn't turn down. That, that was actually probably the beginning of the change, you know, where, where the peloton now speaks English. You know, back then it spoke French and Flemish, and and, and so that you know it, it was the beginning and the start of the of the of the changing of the guard, really, and other countries suddenly becoming present. And yeah, we rocked up ANC. Like you said though, yeah, Seven Eleven was had been there, hadn't they? So they, they made made a, made an input. So tell me about the Flesh Wallone then, because that was your 
biggest result. I mean, uh, back then, it was held on a weekday, wasn't it? A midweek. But it was a long race, wasn't it? It's a couple of hundred kilometres now, but probably 240, 250 back then. Yeah, yeah 256, I think. Yeah, uh, you, you, so you've got to put it in, con- in sort of context there. You know, we've like we've rocked up in south of France we've on, a, on these, on these aw- awful bikes. We haven't been... We had no respect in the peloton either so so you know you try getting through a gap and they saw it was you you got you got shut out so it was you, you, we were on the back foot from the start off but our form was coming you know we were, we were we were we were surviving you know we were we were doing all right so flesh arrived and i knew i, I felt I, I i was going well i felt felt like something was something was starting to come along i was i was on top of it i wasn't feeling like i was um on the back foot at all um, I just remember we went up the Moor. I've got the video actually. I think it's on, on YouTube. And I went up the Moor, and there was a, a crash, or well, someone someone toppled over, got caught out in too big a gear, and it sort of slowed things up. And I can see myself going over the first time over, and I'm way back, but I managed to get onto Kelly's wheel, and uh, and as you go over the top, it narrows down a bit, and um, so we were we were flying back up. He had like three or four of his teammates sort of getting him back up to the front, and I was on Kelly's wheel. So as we were flying past the outside, everyone kind of like swung off to the left, and it just left this big opening. And I had some, you know, I was carrying a lot of speed with me, so I just kept going. So I went past on the right hand side, and and you know there I was off the front in a classic. I wanted to keep going. This will do me. And um, and so then I and I got along caught up with uh, Maddio and. Um, Oh, who's the other guy now? Uh, there's two guys from System U were up the road, and then we stayed away for a lap. Next time up the moor, we dropped. Oh, I should know his name. We, so anyway, we there's just me and Maddio that go over the top, but it all splits behind, and then Roach, Goltz, Coquillion, Leclerc. What's that for? Yeah, they they join us, making six, and then we then stay away. For, for, till the end did it finish on the top of the moor in, yeah. in that year yeah yeah, yeah finished on the top yeah and um, but I, I I mean it was all attacking at the end and uh, my I, a spoke went in on the last lap it, it, well near, I don't know 10k out I guess and it was starting to play up not enough to stop but then I, well, I wouldn't have, couldn't have done that anyway but it definitely was you know unnerved me a bit um, and then I think I, fin- I rolled in six and then Malcolm Elliott finished third in the Amstel Gold Race, maybe ten days after that, didn't he? So I mean, he couldn't. I mean, a dream spring, really. But was it the difficulty of trying to balance the domestic campaign as well? Because you would have had the Milk Race in May, a uh, two-week stage race, tough with all the East European teams coming over. You know, they were, although they weren't pro because of the Berlin Wall. You know, they couldn't compete in professional races. They were, they were some real strong talented riders weren't there yeah I mean they were as, as good as you know they, they had some proper backing and also a lot of big motivation so they were yeah they were like, super strong really we should have just been we should have taken those two results backpedaled a little bit enjoyed that cruised and just and then got ready for the next year but instead it was like right now we're going for the tour and that just we we were just battered at that point you know there was no we should have just just kicked off kicked back a bit but we didn't so you did the milk race that year did you and then into more french stage races like the midi libra i know you did that year as well uh, from that point on i think from the t- i think i got i was king of the mountains when i think i may have got fourth in the in the milk race but from that point on i i, I was burnt and i really shouldn't have ridden any anymore i think we started a big stage race in France not the next day but the day after the last stage of the milk race yeah it was just too much for me I think that would have been the midi libra down in the south east because isn't, isn't that the stage where you and Malcolm tried to pull out of the race <laughs> it's quite comical really, isn't it I, I, I had really had enough and so I, 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 <laughs> this is really so I, I, I kept saying to Matt, Matt, come on, let's, let's, I've had enough of this, let's stop. I, I don't know why I didn't have the kahunas to do it myself, really, just pull over. I just wanted me, him to stop with me. So I just kept on and on and on at him. All this, I think it was the third stage. 
I think it was a 200 and odd kilometre stage. It was really hot, and it was just like, oh, just what are we doing here? And so I kept every t- alongside him, Malk, Malk, get off, get off, get off. And it was, in the final, he agreed, right, okay, right, we'll get off. So I said, right, so come into this town. If it goes right, we go left. If it goes left, we go right. So he said, right. So we come flying into this town. The race turned right, we turned left, it was a dead end. So, of course, I don't know what what we thought or planned we were going to do. We were just going to ride off into the distance. <laughs> what were we going to do? We didn't even know where we were. So we, we've turned left, it's a dead end. We suddenly put our brakes on think, oh no. There's all these parked cars to the left. But of course, all the crowd had seen us go down there thinking, oh, they've got lost or so for some reason they've gone the wrong way. So they're stopping all the police cars and officials and pointing to us and saying, look, they're down there. So we, by now, have got off our bikes and we've hidden. So we're hiding behind two, two, two park cars. And all of a sudden, the race officials start walking down and then get alongside us and find two ANC riders cowering behind this car. We literally got pulled out by our ears and just dragged off and just like, no one knew why or what. And oh, we just had to give up. And just, it just was quite embarrassing, really. Really embarrassing. So you had to ride on. No, 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 we got in the team. No, that was it. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, we got in the team car and that was it, yeah. yeah it wasn't our greatest hour, that was for sure. <laughs> but I guess an indication that you were just being, for the level you were at, you, you had the talent, and but to, to try and compete, you had to have that durability, not just physically, but mentally. And, uh, and after five months of, of racing, that was beginning to frazzle, was it? Yeah, because it was, we had no, um, there was no backup, you know. We had no doctors, we had no... We had no, um, you know, you, you're getting, we're all getting crammed in cars. So we like, we were, we were driving, when we were riding to the race, there was like three in the back, two in the front, you know, just loaded up with stuff, no support, no food. No, it was, it really took its toll. And, um, and then to be thrown in midi Libra immediately after the milk race, it was, oh, it was just too much. So tell me how you heard that you'd been selected for the Tour de France. That was on uh, at, at Blue Peter. Karen Keating was the host of Blue Peter and uh, it was going to be the big announcement on Blue Peter that the team was in the first British team to ride the tour. Well, none of us wanted to ride it. So we were there thinking, oh, Christ, I hope we don't get in it. So we're there and there, were, there, were gonna, there was a phone call going to come through from Paris, I guess, to say, yes, the ANC is in the team or not. So live on Blue Peter, anyway, like, filmed on Blue Peter, the big announcement, yes, you're in the team. Well. I don't know whether they expected us to sort of jump up and sort of be full of joy, but what all of us just put our head in our hands and went, oh no. <laughs> went out on Blue Peter, yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's order some lunch and then uh, we'll, we'll come back and we'll talk about the 87 tour and then everything that's happened to you since. How much did you know about the Tour de France and specifically the, the route of the Tour de France before you actually headed off to West Berlin was where the start was, wasn't it, in 87? Uh, well, you've got the profile, you know. I don't think we quite realised. You've raced all year with the same guys, but for some reason the speed goes up five miles an hour or maybe more. It really, really is noticeably faster. Also, Berlin was really, really hot and humid, which didn't help me at all. You see the you see the profile, but I think that was one of the last years with the really long stages. They're, they're a lot lot shorter now. What were you expecting before you set off? Well, I don't know if I even thought anything really. I was uh, remember we'd arrived at the tour. Uh, most of us hadn't been paid. We were all burnt out. None of us really wanted to be there. We kn- we all knew we'd bitten off more than we could chew. I really. I don't know what was going through my head. I think I actually just wanted to go home. I just wanted to. I'd already signed for uh, Hitachi, so I knew next the following year was all right. And I, to be fair, I don't know what was going through my head. Hitachi was one of the big Belgian teams at the time, so they obviously spotted your performances in, particularly in Flesh Wallone earlier in the spring. So you you were kind of on your knees getting to the tour. But what what was the team like at the time? Because you had. Obviously, had Malcolm Elliott, who probably the best chance of, a, of an unlikely stage win. Adrian Timmis was billed as a team's climber, but was going into the unknown, really. Um, Shane Sutton, who was kind of, I mean, he was a crit rider, really. He wasn't, wasn't a Grand Tour-type rider. And you also had a, a defectee from behind the Iron Curtain. Hello. 
Palov, Omar Palov, or Ketoslav Palov, Czechoslovakia. And I mean, from everything I've read and, and people I've spoken to, he, he was really very nervous being as close to the Eastern Bloc as, as he was in West Berlin, I guess. Yeah, he was genuinely worried that he might get seized and, and taken off. Yeah, we had a team that Adrian had got third in the stage in Midi League earlier. So Adrian was coming to, to form. Me and Mal could come to form earlier in the year. Adrian was coming to form then. The team was good, but I think when you've not been paid and you don't know if the team's going to... I mean, it, it, it's not good for morale. There was already an in, infighting going on in the team, and so that it was really it was all coming unglued. The wheels were coming off already. The atmosphere was, you know, not not right. And what was Kappa's kind of management style like? I think he left most of the sort of the, the tactics and so on to Phil Griffiths and and the Belgian sports director Ward Wouters. But he was a, in every sense, a big presence around the team, wasn't he? He was calling the shots, I guess. Yeah, he was. He obviously, clearly, he thought he knew more than he actually did. But it was the last throw of the dice, really. So they just got gathered up all the money that they had left, including our wages, and thrown it at the, to get us into the tour. You know, they knew that the money was running out. It didn't even survive the tour. You know, money was expired before we even got to the tour, I think. There was a weird atmosphere, really. I think I'm right in saying there was an entry fee to be paid of around about £30,000 to get it to confirm the place in the tour. Um, so that may be where, where the money went. Um, but in terms of sort of starting the race and getting through the stages, do you remember much about what those stages were like? Uh, we were the team time trial early on in, 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 in Berlin and uh, I remember just hanging on and I knew I, uh, you know, I, I, knew I wasn't in a, it wasn't well clearly wasn't well and I also just remember it being a lot lot faster than all, all the races had been all, all that year huge crowds you know just it was a you know the big it's the big Tour de France and also the first time in Berlin the wall was up then as well so personally I knew I wasn't gonna gonna get to the finish I wasn't gonna make it to Paris so I, I just I knew also it was it was I wanted to say I'd win the tour so I started the tour so it was a large part of the reason why I I went but also I thought I was going to ride the next year anyway we'd probably be to Itachi so how far did you make it well I only just made it into France <laughs> but I did make it although some said you know which which riders started the Tour de France but never made it to France but that's not true I did make it into France I did six stages I went home and just went straight I just spent days in bed I was really really physically exhausted what happened after that did you ever see Tony Kappa again no apparently he did a run a midway through the tour I think and uh, never to be seen again we, we never got paid so I never got paid from before the tour until after we tried to get some claim some money back but no he just did he just did one and how did you feel about that were you resentful or was there a part of you that was kind of grateful that you'd, you'd had the opportunities you'd had yeah I did write to him and said look you know you have not paid me and you, you know you do owe me a load of money but you did get us to the tour even though it was probably misdirected and misplaced you know his heart was in the right place so I just said thank you you know thanks for that how do you think he'd fit in in the world of um, you know elite professional sport these days because some of his methods perhaps weren't uh, I think on a training camp he went off to the supermarket and got all the food for the riders. You were staying in apartments somewhere in France, is that right? Yeah, yeah. We, uh, he, you know, he got he got the job of. Um, it was a training camp near Cannes, and we were uh, we had uh, these chalets, and we were two riders per chalet, so we were all cooking for ourselves. So he had gone off to get to get the, uh, and I remember him coming back with big tins, big tins of sausage and beans in some horrible sauce and, we, and and some other sort of really horrible stuff it was you just wouldn't eat it you know and he just slammed it on the table and says go on guys get that down here make you strong put airs on your chest <laughs> so I mean nowadays yeah no way so how did you finish the year I mean you, you sort of I think you did a Nissan Classic the, the big stage race in Ireland at the end of the year before uh, setting off on, on the kind of the, the pro adventure um, signing for a big Belgian team at the time, they were led by Claude Criquillion, um, who's a classics rider, been world champion in Barcelona in '84, I think it was. So, uh, one of the stars of, of Belgian cycling at the time. Tell me about the Hitachi setup and and um, and what you actually did. 
Yeah, well, so I came back from the tour, rested up, got my energies back strong again, went to the Nissan Tour. I, I lost the climber's jersey by one point. I basically, Van Lenka got in the break on the early stages and got a load of points, and I won every prem after that. But he, he, he beat me by one point, so I just missed that. And then Yev yeah, went over to ride for, uh, for Itachi, and, uh, I mean, again, that was like the last of the old school teams you know and we had uh, the, the, the direct was um, a guy called De Kimper who was like wider than he was tall and and used to walk around with a there's a picture on 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 if you put it Tachi 87 or something there's a, a team poster and he stood in front of the car and you'll see him and, and there's a at the base of the car is, is this sort of like old sort of briefcase and that was just full of money full of Belgium notes envelopes and uh, so one by one you went into the t- into sign your contract and you got like this big envelope and uh, you know sort of uh, yeah he was a gangster this is Albert de Kimpe no longer with us so uh, the, the lawyers won't be all over us for, for describing him as a gangster but that wasn't uncommon at the time was it I mean without wanting to generalise too much in those days running a sports team in Belgium was kind of a way to get rid of some money I guess was it apparently so you know it was uh, it seemed seemingly to be you know I remember we were in uh, Switzerland and we'd, r- we'd r- ride some some race there and I could see all the team having a chat in the car park so I just was wandered over and as I got to the group they just went turned and went oh 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 Paul and they just shoved an envelope in my hand <laughs> with some cash in it and I, I just often thought well if I hadn't wandered over you know would I have got that I had no idea what it was for it was for something or other <laughs> so where did you live when you when you first got to Belgium tell me about that I lived in Wallingham and uh, in a hotel kind of loosely loosely worded it was a, it was a hotel and on the top floor but by then my 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 my, uh, my morale had well gone so I was going out literally for an hour to the cafe, having a cup of coffee and coming home. Still getting some results, but uh, my heart wasn't in it. And I remember being at the, uh, at the dinner table and uh, the team director called Brackevelt said, uh, Hey, Paul, eh? how was the training? What, what did you do this week? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, Monday, four hours, Tuesday, five, Wednesday, six, you know, just reeling off these numbers. <laughs> And he whacked his finger and he says, no, I don't think so, eh? He says, Monday, one hour. Tuesday, one hour. Wednesday, you didn't go out. So the hotel manager had been dobbing me in. So I thought, oh, no. So from then on, I had to go out with my headphones on. (laughs) Near to the canal. They had a nice bench on there. And I used to just park up there and put my headphones on and go to sleep for a couple of hours and then get a nice big sweat on the way back. And the following week, the back of it went, hey, boy, now the form comes, eh? I went, yeah, right. So you're out the hotel for four hours, five hours, but still doing your one-hour training ride. Yeah, yeah, kept me morale together. That was for sure. I should have spent more in the coffee shop, I think. But somebody that you got to know while you were there is Brian Holm, who's now the a sports director at Quick Step Floors, um, and you became very good friends. I mean, but kind of he was everything in those days, everything that you weren't. He had the kind of the mental focus to be able to clock the hours that needed to be clocked, I guess. Yeah, we, we were amateurs together in Labrador. There's a really good picture, I think it's in his book, of me and him on the podium in um, early season classic. He won it, I was second. We lived together and he used to go out for massive rides and I used to go home and put the tea on. <laughs> and uh, that's how it was. We'd go out together and then I'd sort of give it an hour, I'd turn around and say, well, I'll get dinner on, <laughs> I'll see you when you get back. So uh, at the end of 88, your time at Hitachi came to an end. Tell me a little bit about the circumstances that, that led to you leaving European cycling, really. We all know now, but there, there was a huge issue of drugs. And as the years were going on, I mean, obviously in ANC, I was aware of it, not in the ANC team, but we were aware of what was going on with other teams. Not, not that it was with Hitachi, but I mean, I was aware of what was going on. It was, it was, it was rife and it was also worrying. I just realised, you know, I'm not sure if I'm up for that. It's part of me feels that I didn't, that I sh- should have done in a way. I mean, I felt that I've, but I, I just, I just had to walk away. I, ju- I just couldn't, I couldn't, I was, I, I just couldn't go that extra step. 
But in the end, you almost didn't have a choice about walking away, did you? Because you met up with a, a journalist from The Guardian over Christmas, I think, and you, you, you kind of lifted the lid to, to perhaps a bit over dramatic. but you gave a, an interview about what the European cycling scene was, was like. Tell me a bit, a bit about that. I'd finished with Itachi. I'd come home. I was completely demoralised in, in a way that I just thought... You know, do do I join it or do I don't? Do I do I take part in it? And uh, then I met this guy from the Guardian, Jeffrey Beatty, who went on to be the psychologist on Big Brother. If anyone yeah. remembers watching Big Brother on Channel Four? Yeah, that's right. And uh, we started talking. No, I met him socially, so I'm like sort of got, I've, I've got making no excuses, but my guard was down. But then having said that, my guard was down. Meaning what? Meaning I was I should have kept quiet about the the emerg. So the emerg there was with me. You know, I, I felt that I shouldn't have talked about something that I walked away from, but I did. So I, I, I opened out and I just said like, this is what's going on. It was the half page in the Guardian. It was a massive big. I got the biggest picture, bigger than Gorbachev, who had just done something pretty amazing. And I was on the back page, and it just said drugs or something in sport. And it was a massive piece. And oh my God, the phone went mental and I was like everyone felt that I'd sort of accused everyone else and British riders were sort of ringing up saying you know you're saying it's it's in the pro class well I don't do it and we said they didn't you know but it was it was worded in a way that had I known it this article was going to be written like it was then then I wouldn't have I would have structured it differently or anyway or worded differently but anyway along the short of it was I was refused a British licence the British Cycling Federation withdrew my professional licence because they said I'd brought the sport into disrepute because I'd mentioned about the drugs in sport you know I wasn't taking it yet for some reason that's talking about it was worse than taking it I was in a bit of a pickle because I, I wanted to race again and Brian said I can get you on Sigma if you want I couldn't get a pro licence This is the Belgian Sigma team just for listeners who don't remember or aren't familiar with those years a, a decent sized team wasn't it Etienne de Wilder was their big Belgian sprinter um, another one of the established teams teams out there but because you didn't have a licence you couldn't ride for anyone in Europe No so I, I, I was really stuck and and and, um, and you know I, hadn't, I, I because I'd been resting all winter and uh, uh, yeah I became British uh, duathlon champion so I was running running I, I was I clocked 31 minute 10k I had some good form coming and I thought oh maybe I, my, my morale was lifting again from Itachi and I, I was prepared to go back again but now all of a sudden British cycling won't give me a license so I had no option then but to go to California and try to race what was just starting was mountain biking because I could race with Norba and Norba wasn't UCI so I didn't need a, a, a British or UCI licence Norba, I can't remember what it stands for, it's something like North American Off-Road Racing Association or something like that but yeah, it was, mountain biking was really just beginning wasn't it, in, in 88, 89 we're talking about the start of 89 here aren't we and, uh, and so this new sport hadn't yet been kind of taken over by the UCI so it wasn't under their jurisdiction so you were, you were free to race and you were pretty good at the mountain biking well, yeah, because I'd been good. I'd been British National Cross Champ, so uh, so I, 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 you know, I thought, well, I should be able to handle this, no problem. So I went over, landed in California, and uh, stayed with a friend, Daniel Westbury, who we'd raced together as juniors, the same age as me, but he was living over there at the time. So I stayed with him. I didn't have a mountain bike though, so I went to this local sort of bike shop and said, "Can I borrow a mountain bike?" So he lent me this mountain bike. Looking back, this thing weighed thirty pounds. This thing was huge, it was massive heavy thing anyway there was a race I can't remember what it was but it basically went up this mountain and then came down the other side and that was it of course going up I was you know, flow. I was thinking I was at the top three minutes ahead of everyone else coming down the side different story and I just I, I just got pummeled all the way down there and falling off I just couldn't it was it, it, I suddenly realised it was a different ball game this mountain biking following that then there was another race that was similar to cycling across and I think I won that or got second and then I spoke to Marin Mountain Bikes and said, oh, why don't you ride for us? And then they were going to give me a contract, give me bikes, and, and so that's where it started. That must have been really exciting, being in on the ground floor of something that was about to take off. I mean, it, it was huge in those years, wasn't it, the late 80s and early 90s. And there must have been a fair bit of cash around as well. You know, probably, you probably did as well, or perhaps even better, out of American mountain biking than you would have done as a pro in Europe. Well, yeah, because I was like, I was living in in uh, Mill Valley, just over the Golden Gate Bridge uh, in San Francisco. There, I was I had a lovely apartment. You know, I had a good contract. Um, we'd fly to the races. They're always at ski resorts. 
they always had a party before, which I quite liked, and then a party afterwards. So, I mean, it was like made for me. But yeah, I, I, I loved it. Yeah, I was, I was enjoying myself. And then uh, a, a, another incident, basically a misfortune, you, you crashed and uh, broke your arm, didn't you? That season, I, I did did well, won, won some races, got up there in the overall, in the, in the big races. Um, but I realised my descending was shocking, really bad. So, so I spent all that winter training on, on Mount Tam, doing some like real fast descending. And it, just before the start of the new year, or the new season, there was a local kind of hot shot descender and I, I was on his tail the whole way down. I just suddenly realised I can, I can descend now, I'm good enough. And I was really getting excited for the following year. And Shimano sent me these new pedals. I'm not blaming Shimano, but uh, they sent me these new pedals and they were they prototype clippings that just, just started coming over. And this spring was on full tension, whereas now they're coming with fully off, but they were fully on. So I put it on, clipped my foot in, ridden to the cafe for the meet to meet everyone and I couldn't I couldn't get my foot out I've asked around for a two mil spanner and no one had a two mil and I, I could get my foot out but it was a real oh you know to click to get it out uh, we've gone on off done some crazy sort of descending great caught of two or three hour ride I was coming back we're going down this, this nondescript sort of descent and I was chatting about what we where we were going to go for, for lunch and to, to the guy ahead of me Logan and uh, suddenly I just slipped on this uh, route, still not thinking anything of it, went to get my foot out and, and couldn't get my foot out, still not really thinking anything of it, and there was like grass, high grass on the side of this sort of trail, and suddenly the grass parted, and I'm going through the grass, and now there's a massive like, 50 foot drop into trees, and I've just gone through the air, and then I've landed, and I've hit a tree on the way down, and I've broken my right arm took a while to get that fixed and it, it didn't get properly fixed for a long while did it no no I, they decided that the arm needed plating so it got plated and then the surgeon decided that he'd plate my radial nerve while he was at it so my radial nerve got plated at the same time i lost the use of my arm the use of my hand and that that was a horrific time i, I, I then had to have a, a nerve graft out of my leg so i had to have a sensory nerve sewn into a motor nerve on my arm to wait another year and a half while the nerve sort of regenerated and I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to say that it, my uh, arm um, is, uh, is now 80% it's alright well we're talking 30 years on aren't we well, almost 30 yeah, years on but it's, it's still still feel it yeah it's, it was pioneering operation then and uh, I was lucky that uh, I was at the Presbyterian and there was a, a guy that was like able to do those sort of operations so I was really lucky so that was the end of, of, of a any kind of cycling as a career I guess was it yeah that pretty put, put paid to it although I was still fit and I still ran and uh, but then I just decided that I was going to manage the Marin team so I managed the team for a couple of years three or four three years I think at some point you you invented a hub that Campagnolo takes credit for and that's the way you tell the story isn't it <laughs> no I did invent, now listen I it's not very often you reinvent a wheel okay but I can honestly say I reinvented the wheel. And for those of you who are listening, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the patent number. I got a US patent uh, for a wheel hub. And the number is, so it's US patent 54294221 uh, under Paul B. Watson. The hubs that, that, that Campagnolo, Shimano and most of the, 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 the Mavic, they use my patent. So what was different about it back then that no one else was doing? And, and why aren't you now a gazillionaire? Yeah, yeah. so I spent 10 grand with a, with a patent lawyer. I've gone, right, this is the way wheels will be done from now. Effectively, it uses straight pull spokes. So you, you drop a straight pull spoke into a pre-aligned groove that's pre-aligned to go in the direction of the, of the nipple. So everything, you just drop the spokes in and they're already set. Because prior to that, the only way a wheel could be laced was that the spoke would go in and then be bent round and then uh, fit into the, the, the rim, uh, the nipple in the rim, wouldn't it? So you'd have, you'd have effectively have a kind of a weak point on the, on the spoke, wouldn't you? Because it would be bent at a very sharp angle into the, into the hole in the hub. Yeah, you had the, you had like the, the little kind of uh, little elbow at the very bottom of the, of the spoke and then you would lace the spokes up 
and then you would end up bending that little bit to, just to sort of make it all fit. And I remember lacing wheels up and thinking, this can't be right. You know, you're, you're weakening the integrity of the, of the metal. And, um, and then suddenly I just looked at it and just thought, it just came to me in, in a flash. So I, I, I drew it, got it made as prototype. This is in San Francisco. Took it to a patent lawyer. Uh, we, got, we got the patent. We got everything. I came back to England got into housing, got into other things, for completely forgot about it, and people were saying to me, are you that, that wheel of yours, I'm sure Cam Bagnolo are doing that wheel, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I, I was in Smith's, opened a Cycling Weekly, looked, there it was, my hub. Went running to the patent lawyer in England, said, slap my US patent on the table, said, look, infringement. He went, oh, yes, definitely. And he said to me, when did you last renew it? And at no point did this guy in America at any point tell me you have to renew it every four years for five years. And it had expired. And I just, fuck, what do you do? I was just like, yeah, felt pretty cheesed off. <laughs> well, considering that is now pretty much the way all, all wheels are, are, are made, isn't it now? Yeah, no, that's it. Yeah, every time I see it, I'm thinking, cha-ching, that should be in my pocket. Oh, yeah, it was one of the, I just, yeah, what did you do? I've tried to come up with some other, you know, but that was it. I think you only get one good idea in your lifetime, and that was mine. Well, you say that, but I mean, you, you know, since you stopped cycling professionally and making money from that, I mean, you've, what have you done since the, the mid '90s? And because you went off the grid, really, you, you, you lost touch with the world of cycling. It wasn't something that you you, you certainly weren't around until. I mean, I remember in 2007 when I was trying to write this series for Cycle Sport magazine about the ANC team, you were a difficult man to get hold of. Nobody seemed to really know where you were at that time. So what had, what had happened in the kind of the, the 12, 13 years between mountain biking in America and um, me tracking you down back here in Milton Keynes? I kind of had had enough of it. You know, uh, uh, you, you do get burnt. I'd been burnt. You know, I, 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 I wasn't a nice experience. I can't say that I'd enjoyed the last few years. Obviously, what happened when, they, when the British Cycling denied me my licence. And then there's a, just another caveat to that. When I had my nerve on my arm plated in America by the doctor, I had to sue the doctor, of course, because it was negligence. And my lawyer was building a case for me as to how good I would have been or whatever or how this is impacting my future earnings, etc. Jerry McDade from British Cycling flew to America and testified against me, predominantly over I don't know what. I still don't know why. What? Saying you wouldn't have been as good as your lawyer was trying to say you would have been? Yeah, he was trying to have have a, a negative effect on, on my potential earnings so he saw it upon himself to f- well they flew or he, he went on the on 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 the on their side and and flew to san francisco and i was in a room with jerry mcdade sat opposite me telling the lawyers that i was no good and i would never have been any good and and i just to this day cannot f- understand or know why he did that did you ever have that out with him he came up to me in the Tour of Britain once and uh, he tried to shake my hand and I just looked at him in sort of disbelief and I just thought, you worm of a man, you horrible, horrible man. And I just, uh, I just, just, that was it, I just couldn't. But you did get a payout because of the, the operation being done incorrectly, didn't you? Yeah, I got, I got, I got, a, I got a payout, yeah, they did eventually pay out. But... A f- I'm sure it could have been an awful lot more if Jerry McDade hadn't come over there. But, uh, you know, I got a sufficient amount and um, I came back to, or when I was in England, I, I just caught the start of the housing boom. So I was in a nice position where I had some funds and then I, I just, just rode that housing boom wave. So when did you start getting back in touch with cycling again then? Because uh, I think 2007 you weren't really in touch with anybody at that point. But then, you know, over the next few years... Um, I mean, when I when I when we met um, here in Milton Keynes then ten years ago, you know, when to think of the landscape then, you know, Mark Cavendish was just coming onto the scene. The British cycling boom hadn't really happened yet, and so you know, A and C Halfords and as the last pro British pro team to have ridden the Tour de France, you know, it had it really resonated, particularly with the twentieth anniversary. When did you kind of get back into? contact with a few of the old people that you knew and and what what did you make of the whole thing um you know witnessing the way that the profile of cycling has changed in this country you know between around 2008 2012 13 
Tim Harris rang me up and he said, do you want to drive one of the um, hospitality cars for Skoda in the Tour de France? I thought, well, that sounds all right. That was 07. I went with him and two others uh, and we, I drove the hospitality car that year and it was the start of the, you know, obviously at the tour I was meeting other people and I started, sort of got back into it. What do they do? Do you drive on the course ahead of the race? Is that how that happened with VIPs and then make sure they get to their, you know, where they're, they're staying and having their nice meals and all the rest of it? Yeah, it's quite nice. So you, uh, in the morning, you'd, you'd have, say, three, three guests per car. So there's four cars, but I had three guests, and then you'd be assigned those, and then you'd obviously introduce yourself and any questions, but it'd be at the uh, Tour de France village. And then you'd, you'd leave, uh, I think, about an hour before the start of the tour. So you'd go, obviously, the crowd's already out, so you'd go up the mountains and whatever with, the, with your guests listening to race radio and then there would be a pre where all the helicopters were parked up so then you drop your guests off at the helicopter they go off in the helicopter see the tour from the air and then you would uh, carry on to the drop off point where the helicopters drop them off they get in your car and then you drive them to the finish and then they have hospitality at the end very nice and what did you make of the tour seeing it for the first time in 20 years and and you know realizing that the last time you probably saw it you were climbing off the bike yeah, actually, I remember it being really hard riding it, and it was bloody hard as well driving it, because it was exhausting. It's an exhausting experience. I think you, journalists, TV crew, it's just a month of hell. It really is tough. Did you not enjoy anything about it? No, not really. That's why I only did it once, and then Tim keeps asking me to go back, and I'm like, no, I'm not going to do it. That's it. <laughs> But what did you make of the whole sort of the big show, the big circus, the way the riders, you know, the experience for the riders now must be very different to what what you experience yeah i think it looks nice you know, you've got buses now and you've got like uh, uh oh, it's all it's nice you know the run this, this, it's not so far you're not riding so you're not burying yourself every stage i think you can survive after it you know riders now are going on an awful lot longer um and it just uh, but it is it's a great spectacle but i prefer to watch it from the tv <laughs> Do you think, in a way, you you were born a bit too early? If you'd been, you know, around uh, able now. I mean, I, tell me the story about when you were. I think with Hitachi and a training camp in the south of France. I mean, as a as a British person in French hotels, I mean, it's not great now. You know, there's no TV you can watch. But at least nowadays, the riders have all got mobile phones and and laptops and you know technology that can keep them in touch with um, people at home and the outside world and kind of keep them sane. But you you had none of that, and and your personality wasn't really suited to the monastics. You know, being locked away. Uh, and the, tell me the story about the training camp where you're trying to get everybody to go out so we'd been there I think about a week and we'd been doing some like mega rides and uh, and getting back and obviously you know the other riders were just sort of tucking themselves up into into bed and uh, and so I, we'd be, I remember it being the afternoon and I'm looking at it, it's a beautiful day and I'm like oh, come on this will, can't we go out now so I went to I don't know Mark Sargent's and said come on Mark do you want to come to town he said what for I said well coffee or something he says oh who's going I said well no one knew so he said so I went to find Dirk, Dirk the Wolf I said Dirk do you want to come he says, who's going Mark Sargent and you now so he's like oh I'm not anyway I had to go around the whole team I mustered up about three guys that finally wanted to go out and I thought right let's go into Cairns and we'll sit on the seafront and have a nice cup of coffee and you know soak up the atmosphere so of course none of us could drive other than Brackevelt so I had to go and then talk Brackevelt into coming the team team manager so finally I finally got four of us four riders and Brackevelt and we sort of get out and we get in the car and I couldn't I felt like come on please let's go so we're just driving down the coast road I'm getting all excited can't wait to get to Cairns he takes a left and goes to this supermarket and walks into a supermarket (laughs) And then was just walking around trying to get the freebies off the stand. It was just, and I was, oh, it was at that point I realised, you know, good guys though. <laughs> but these days, you know, you'd have your, you know, you, you wouldn't be cut off from the outside world. And from the sounds of it, the way you've embraced the uh, the, the watts, you would have. Um you would have fitted right in with the, you know, the, the training. You'd have, you'd have been able to see your progress, and probably more importantly, you'd be able to tell when you were getting burned out. Yeah, now nowadays it would have really, really suited me, you know. Uh, and I, I uh, but then again, you know, 
I'm sure everyone looks back. You know, you go back to Simpsons and he probably would have been better in my ear. And then sort of, it was what it was. You know, we we but we had back then though, you had a lot more freedom to race. You know, you could shoot from the hip. You could you 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 raced as you wanted to. Now it's so controlled. You know, like uh, you know, it's raced from the car really. And um, and I think that's had a detrimental effect on the on the on the racing it's not so exciting as it used to be to be fair though yeah I think I would have preferred it now and so just finally um, we were talking right at the start about your rediscovering racing and and getting pretty good pretty quickly um, and then winning a world championship at the age of 54 at that point yeah Yeah. finishing elite elite Kermes races in Belgium um, with riders that probably some of them 35 years younger than you yeah well I I, I, I joined the uh, went to Café Surplus where the um, Dave Rayner funded guys are so yeah they were like 19, 21 I was older than their dad so that was but they took me in they, they were great they were really nice guys and you more than held your own oh yeah well the first one yeah I won't say who there were three of us that went to the first one and uh, the, two, the two the two Rayner boys didn't finish but I did <laughs> And then, I mean, it's uh, you know, it's a theme of, of, of your of your life, really. But then you have this this accident with a camper van, and your your leg now, several months later, still um, it's recovering, but it's, it's a slow process, isn't it? I mean, how's that? Um, you know, how are you reflecting on that, and how you know, have you have you taken anything from what's happened to you recently? Yeah, it's uh, it's made me stop. It's made me uh, think how lucky I am, or oh, luck. But it makes me f- makes me. I've just we've mentioned that word, but it, it makes me um, not lucky, but reflect on what I've got and what's important and what's of value. And when you th- sit down, when I was looking out at the window of Adam Brooks Hospital, and you know, just watching the birds flit by the little window outlook that I had and I was just thinking you know what the most important thing is your friends having a nice coffee with them spending time with them just don't matter what watch you got what car you drive you know if you're healthy and you've got good friends really that's the only thing that matters and so it may be a long uh, a, a long journey but the, the goal is to get back on the bike and, and go on a, a, at the very least a coffee run that would be nice yeah, that was my... When I was lying in Adam Brooks, I just thought, you know what, if I can ever ride a bike again, if I can ever... I'm just going to enjoy nice sunshine with me mates, going to have a nice coffee somewhere. And finally, 30 years on from riding the Tour de France, uh, what will your reflection be when, when the big race comes around again this summer? It's always good to watch, especially now. I mean, we've had such a great time, haven't we, with British winners and British... I mean, Cav and Bradley and and you know Stannard and I mean it's it's been a golden era. We've been so lucky to have this golden era. You know, Ireland had it with Roach and Kelly, and we've got it now. Let's hope it doesn't come to an end. Let's hope there's new guys coming through, and we can keep riding it for a bit longer. You mentioned Stannard there. He's another Milton Keynes boy, isn't he? Do you, do you know him at all? Not as well as I'd like because I um, he's been away really because he's in Monaco, isn't he? You know, and he's racing and he's come back and I didn't really know him before very well. So, um, but of course, no, he's the he's the Milton Keynes superstar now. Tough choice, isn't it, Milton Keynes or Monaco? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your property portfolio might not be quite so large if you lived in Monaco, though. Probably about to buy one bed flat, probably there. Yeah. <laughs> And just very lastly, then, um, any plans to uh, you know catch up with some of the people that you know? You know Brian Holm, you know very well. Have you been in touch with him at all? Yeah, well, he, he, when he after the accident, he was he, he, he rang me and we've been texting and um, and uh, to be fair, I've been so busy. Well, being hospitals and you know surgeries and rehab and all things like that. I haven't. I've 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 been pretty much just uh, you know I was two months on the couch and so. Um, but it would be nice when I can sort of walk a bit better to, to get to meet up with everyone. And who was it who, the first message that came through after you came out of surgery when you were in hospital? Yeah, I'm not, not name dropping here, but it was really nice. Brian spoke to um, to Paul Smith and uh, when I came out of the 12 hour op and I was I had a bucket and I'm spearing into it and uh, Steve Sefton was there who, 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 you know, he really supported me when I was in hospital and uh, the, my phone went beep, 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 and the first text I saw was from Paul Smith saying, uh, get well, and I hope you, uh, hope you have a good recovery. 
Very nice. Well, Paul, it's been a pleasure to catch up with you again. Uh, we won't leave it so long next time. What, another 10 years? <laughs> I hope I'm still around. I think even we can push to uh, paying for lunch once every 10 years. <laughs> oh, good. Well, uh, this one's on you then. Hey, it's Alexis Ryan, rider from Canyon Stram, and you're listening to the Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa. What I like about Rafa is their attention to detail and quality, producing the best clothing on the market. My most memorable ride was my first ride back after breaking my arm in 2014, and I can't ever remember being so excited to get on the bike. The Rafa Cycling Club is the largest global community of its kind. Members share their passion for the road through rides, events, exclusive club kits and racing. Find out more at rafa.cc. Thank you very much indeed to Rafa, our main sponsor at the Cycling Podcast. Uh, Before we heard from Alexis Ryan there, we heard Lionel's Lunch with Paul Watson, the second in an occasional series. If you've got any other suggested guests for Lionel to have lunch with, we're only too pleased to hear them. Um, I really enjoyed that that conversation. As we said uh, in the introduction, not not a, a name that uh, many of you perhaps will be familiar with, but an incredible story and uh, really enjoyed hearing it. Um, after that, we heard the trailer there for uh, from Alexis Ryan's uh, Tour of California diary. Joe Dombrowski kept the diary for us at the Giro last year, which was released as a friend special exactly a year ago. Uh, so we thought we'd do it again with a female rider this time and she did a really great job um you know really really took to it and obviously very comfortable talking into the the microphone at the end of each stage and at the beginning of each stage so um thank you very much indeed to alexa Ryan, and that has been released as a friend special this week if you want to sign up as a friend go to this cycling podcast.com and it costs you 10 pounds to sign up and receive 11 at least 11 exclusive friends specials um, so Lionel, just we're going to wrap things up. We're going to return next week with a, a regular, regular podcast with with Daniel. Um, but yeah, we're just we're just sort of recovering from the Giro before we prepare to go again at the Tour de France, where we're going to be joined by Francois Thomaso. Uh, interesting little fact about Francois I remember today is that he covered his first Tour de France um, in 1986. It was a great Greg LeMond Bernardino battle. Um, the last French winner of the Tour de France, 85. Um, so Francois is, is some kind of curse but could this be the year with Roman Bardet perhaps what a story that would be uh, the Dauphiné is going on at the moment as we speak so we're not talking about that this week the crucial stage is still to come and uh, we'll digest that next week um, but yeah you, you recovered fully from the, the Giro line are you getting the energy levels back up the cortisol levels uh, normalised in time for the Tour de France you know me Rich I'm always full of beans Sometimes in Cassoulet country, literally full of beans. I am looking forward to getting down to the southwest of France a couple of weeks into the tour. For uh, I've identified a three-day run of potential Cassoulet uh, meals, so I'm looking forward to that particularly. But yeah, it's a funny old thing, isn't it? Going and doing the, the Giro, and I obviously only did the first couple of weeks, but then watched the whole of the final week on TV and was, you know, absolutely gripped and captivated by the coverage on TV, but also by the podcast. Didn't didn't agree with an awful lot either of you were talking about in the final week, but uh, we'll, we'll maybe we'll maybe touch on that next week when we're all back together. But it's funny, isn't it? Now we have this feels like a lull in the season, but actually this is where the Tour de France riders are all starting to um, begin their ascent to peak form in time for Dusseldorf. We've got the Dauphiné this week, the Tour de Suisse, then the national championships. And then the big show starts and we'll, and we'll be off. And, yeah, there's not an awful lot of downtime between the two, is there? It's funny, isn't it? When you're at the Giro, um, you have the sense this is the most important thing that's going on. Everybody's here. And it, obviously this year, incredible field. And you, Giro finishes and you've got the Dauphiné and you've got this sense again of, well, the, the main show's still to come. Although it's got a, it's got a hard act to follow uh, because it was a captivating Giro, one that we're going to talk about for years to come I, su- I suggest I think the thing you, agreed, you disagreed with us most about was that we didn't give enough credit to Team Sunweb um, in their support of Tom Dumoulin you you, you uh, upbraided me for that already Lionel uh, Yeah, I'm holding the microphone so this is wonderful you're trying to get your word, what are you going to try to say? Well I was just, I think that I think they did a very good job with the resources they had, I don't think anyone pretended that they were um, you know Team Sky 
but what I saw of the early parts of the stages was that they were giving Tom de Moulin a lot of support when they were able to. Sure, they weren't there on the final climbs in any numbers at all, but that's not necessarily what it's all about. By that stage, a lot of the riders were, you know, really only Movistar had any, any strength in numbers. And I thought Sunweb, were, they rode smart. They might not have been the strongest. They might not have had, you know, the ideal support for de Moulin. But what they had, they used incredibly smartly, I thought. I wasn't even aware that we hadn't given them credit. I suppose what we saw, a lot of what we saw was de Moulin being isolated. But de Moulin would have a better idea than us of how valuable his team was. And he was fulsome in his praise. And, uh, you know, certainly made a big point in Milan of celebrating with the whole team and backing his words up with actions because he has since signed a four-year contract with someone which commits them, in theory at least, to a lot of money, I would think, if he develops as we think he will, into a, into a Tour de France contender and possible winner. Um, that, that's, a, that's a big, big statement of intent from Sunweb, and they'll certainly be looking to, to beef up the squad, but also attract, I would think, a lot of additional sponsorship. The big thing is, how are they going to support Ro- um, Warren Barguil for the Tour de France? I mean, they're going to be down to the bare bones, aren't they? <laughs> they certainly are, yeah. Anyway, was that a joke? Well, I mean... You, laugh, you laughed a lot after seeing that. Well, Warren Barguil, it, he's not going to win the Tour, is he? Why not? I don't think, I don't think they're going to have this, that sort of dilemma. No, indeed. Right, listen, let's leave it there, Lionel. We're on a busy street in uh, Islington. Uh, we need to go, and we'll return, as I say, next week with Daniel for a regular podcast. Thank you very much, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. You've been listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Thank you to Glass Pair for the music in this episode. For more information and to download more editions of the show, visit thecyclingpodcast.com.